Good news from the graveyard. He's not dead. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, I see he the living among the dead. There was a resurrection, just like you said. Amen. Power. All right. Lord willing, we're on. All right. Verse 9. But, don't you like the buts in the Bible? Beloved. Who's that talking to? Well, technically it's talking to the Hebrews. That's what the book of Hebrews is written about, right? But we are beloved in his sight, right? Because we're in Jesus Christ. So we can get a spiritual blessing out of this. Doctrinally, it's written to the Jews, and it's during the tribulation period. There's a lot of tribulational stuff all through here, but he's trying to talk to the Hebrews, to Jews. But we spiritually, we're going to get something out of here, and I'm going to use a spiritual context today. But we, beloved, are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have shewed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Isn't that a blessing? And we desire that every one of you do shew the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. The end right there is dealing with the end of the tribulation period. He's talking with the Jews. But to us, the end could be the end of our life, right? The end of the ministry that we have here on this earth. Right? That God, we'd be faithful to the end, to our testimony, right? Paul said, I finished the course. I've kept the faith, right? I fought a good fight, right? Well, listen, when your course is done and it's over with, I want you to be faithful all the way till it's done. Amen. Amen? Father, we love you. I ask you to bless now the preaching of this sermon in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, persuaded. We are persuaded better things of you. Amen. Persuaded. Are you persuaded about anything? Of uh, better things. Isn't that good? Huh? Better things. Of you. Can I say this? Maybe, maybe some, somebody's got high expectations for you. Well, you shouldn't put expectations upon me, preacher. Are you a child of God? Are you saved? You've been born again. Have you met Jesus Christ? Well, then I got great hopes and expectations for you. Michael Raglan used to say, I got great expectations. Amen. I mean, I got great expectations for God. And the bottom line is, is there's a lot of disappointments in the ministry. And there's a lot of people that are bummers. You sow into their lives. You try to put a lot of things in their lives and they fail you. They let you down. They hurt you. There's parents right now that are uh, weeping and crying and standing in their pillows over children that have erred and got into sin and they're locked down or they've murdered or they've done some things. You understand? There's a lot of people that they live their whole life through their kids and then they disappoint them. And they're highly disappointed in their children, the past that they took. I mean, there's daddies that hoped that sons would take after and, and uh, take the farm and run the farm. And they said, I don't want to run the farm. I don't want nothing to do this. I want out of town. I want to go do my own thing. Listen, there's life's filled with disappointments. There's a lot of preachers. When, when somebody comes down and, and makes a profession of faith, we can't wait to see them get what we got and enjoy what we enjoy and come back every service and be excited and want to serve God, support missionaries, go tell sinners. We want to see them read the Bible and devour it, read books and become maybe one day a missionary and become a great preacher serving God. That One day we'd have history books written about how great a move God did through them. A lot of times somebody make a profession of faith, you don't see them, can't find them with a flashlight. Usually most people never 
willing to follow back up a baptism. That's why a bunch of them turn around and say, oh, you got saved. Well, you got to get baptized. And they corral them in a closet, take the clothes off and put a robe on them. Next thing you know, before service over, they're baptizing. Why? You got to be baptized right then. They got baptized right then. I mean, the, the, the guy in the chariot, man, he, he, the Ethiopian, he got saved right there's water. Let's get it done. And that's what they use. The same night, the Philippian jailer, they got baptized the same night. And then that men will tell them, now you're joined to the church. You're a member of the church now. Well, water baptism doesn't put you into the church. Being born again of the Spirit, the Spirit puts you into Christ, which is the church. But they spiritualize it and they try to make it and then they put people into bondage and say, now you're joined our church because you were water baptized into the church. So now you're perpetually bound to sit under me as your pastor. <laughs> But that's what they believe and teach. I don't believe that. I believe you ought to be water baptized. I believe you get saved. I got baptized two weeks after I got saved. Okay, I'll go do it. I don't care. don't matter. That didn't make me automatically a member of that church, but I wanted to go to that church. And then I got, still had some issues with the old nature, and I went off to a boy's home. They was going to help me, and I realized that shouldn't be for me. And then I, all I wanted to do was get a truck and get a job. And I got a truck, got a job, got in a mess because I got out of church. And I closed the Bible and I quit praying. I quit going to church. Next thing you know, I'm in sin for three and a half years. But God kept sending people by to encourage me to get me back in. You know, that church where I got saved, they probably had great expectations for me. Most of them have no idea. I've probably been preaching 32 years. That preacher that came when I was out into sin and knocked on that door that night, talked to me, he probably has no idea that I wound up going in, a in my room and going in my drawer when I ran from God, I took my Bible with me. He probably had no idea I took my Bible with me. And I went and got in that Bible and began to read it. And shortly thereafter, I found a place of repentance. And I got right with God. And then I sputtered a little bit. And then God broke me and I got right in December of 84. That preacher that knocked on that door that night probably thought visitation was a failure that night. He probably had great expectations. He probably had great high hopes. And then the church that ordained me, they probably had great high hopes for me to be maybe come to the next Billy Sunday or something. I disappointed them. Right? And then I would come up here and I come to the Bible Institute. She was marrying Superman. Did you marry Superman? She's asleep. Amen. And uh, you know what? I'm not the next D.L. Moody. And I came up here and studied the Bible. Guess what? I'm not the next Peter Ruff. And guess what? I, I've come up here to go to Bible Institute. And guess what? But you know what people got? They got high expectations, and they got high hopes, right? And uh, guess what? People got high expectations of you, whether you want to believe it or not. And you know what I found out a lot of people do? They got too high expectations for themselves. And you know what? They run into a lot of disappointments and a lot of unnecessary discouragement out there because a man thinks higher of himself than he really is. And the Bible says if we, he says, uh, he that thinketh he's something, when he's nothing, deceive himself. And so I've been in the process of deflating my brain. And I, I, I helped God. I took the valve stem out. There ain't no air trying to, I don't, I don't want no air in here. I don't want my chest puffed out. I don't want none of this stuff. Because I don't want to think more highly of myself than I need to think. And there's a bunch of back slapping that goes on everywhere. There's people slap your back and tell you how great you are and how wonderful you are. And the first thing they do is grab my wallet. <laughs> right? Amen. Listen, I understand. If you love somebody and you want to tell them you appreciate them, I'm not against that. Just be careful of all the extra sugar you put on it. You understand what I'm saying? You don't have to build the guy up that he's the greatest thing since sliced bread because you're going to chop him down the next week. I mean, that's... You understand what I'm saying? But I'm just trying to say people put, whether it's warranted or unwarranted, high expectations upon somebody. Listen, you're a blessing to me by being here, and then you come back every week. and you, Listen, you're a great blessing to me. And if you don't show up, you're missed. I mean, I had a preacher tell me he's coming back. He didn't, he didn't come back. But that ain't the first time he's told me he's coming. You know what I do? I, I, don't, put, I, don't, I don't put stock in anything preachers say anymore. I love preachers, and I listen to preachers. And when they make promises and they say things, I just, I just don't listen to it. I don't grab a hold of that thing. I say, you know what? You're a man. Dax always says it. He said, I'm just a man at best. 
That's all you are is a man at best. And you know what? Men have good intentions, and men will say things, and they'll say, man, brother, I want to do this, and I want us to go do this. And, and boy, they begin to start telling their dreams, and I want you in, and I want to have this meeting. And I and next thing you know, you go, and you go to meet at that meeting, and you go to preach at that meeting, and then in comes some other guy, and he's the big dog. And now you're the little dog, and the little dog stays on the porch while the big dog does the fight. You understand what I'm saying? And then they get the offerings and they get the monies and they, they brought you in and you're just part of the equation instead of being the headline. I'm just trying to tell you, it happens all the time. Men are funny. They're, they're fickle. There's preachers that will lie. They'll tell you the check's in the mail and it ain't in the mail. They never had an intention of writing a check and sending it to you. There's men that say big things and try to create big things. And, boy, they just try to listen. I just learned that whatever men say, it's men talking. It's not Bible. It's not the Holy Ghost. And I'm not convinced that every man that gets up when he speaks is speaking in the Holy Ghost. You understand? And every preacher that's preaching, I don't buy into whatever his rhythmic preaching and spitting and hollering and turning red and blue and doing cartwheels and jumping jacks is, is of God. I line him up according to the Word of God, and if the Holy Ghost will talk to me through the preached words, then I'll accept it. When a man says phrases and he does things, I want to make sure it's lined up with the book. And if the God says, do something about that, you're guilty right here. I'll do something about that. God used the man, but the man's not God and he's not the Holy Ghost. But we get to where we wind up having hero worship even in Christianity. Listen, I love Dr. Ruttman. But when Dr. Ruttman was up here, I shook his hand when he walked through. And me and my wife went to Friendly's right up the road here. And he sat there with somebody. I didn't go over there and make over him and interrupt him. Listen, I like reading his books, but he's a man. He was a man that gave his heart and his life to Jesus Christ. And he told me the truth. I appreciate him for telling me the truth. I didn't agree with everything that he did and said. But I agree with a whole lot that he says. Right? I can't, I can't vouch for Sam Gipp and everything that he's claimed to say or not say, but I, what he has said and I've heard, I like. And he likes me. We've been friends. You understand? I like it. But listen, if Sam Gipp failed tomorrow, God forbid, he's just a man. I'm not going to quit Christianity because one of those guys quit. You understand? Listen, I got great expectations. I want to see these guys do great things. I got great expectations for you. I got great expectations for my kids. But I also know they're sinners saved by the grace of God and they got flesh and they got a carnal nature and they can make bad decisions and they can have bad days. But not very long, right? <laughs> right? I mean, you can get over it. You don't have to dwell in it. But I got great expectations. How about you? You got great expectations? I'm, we are persuaded better things of you. Let me ask you a question. Are you living up to the expectations you set for yourself? I mean, don't, don't all the super leaders out there, don't they get you to get a little day planner and then you sit back and you set all these goals and then you're going to live up to these goals? Isn't that what the most miserable thing in life to do is to look at that list of goals and see how far, how, how far you have fallen from them goals? See how you can't even live up to your own expectations? So then they head to the bars, they go smoke the dope, they get high, they forget about everything because they can't even live up to their own expectations. So why should I even try to live for God? I can't even live for myself, let alone live for anybody else. I can't please the wife, I can't please the kids, can't please the boss, can't please the church. How in the world am I ever going to please the greatest being in the world? Right? New Year's resolution. All right, I'll get up. New Year's nine. We'll eat our pork and our sausage. Amen, and our sauerkraut. And I'll make some vows. I'll make some resolutions. This is going to be different. We are going to get some exercise equipment. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to go on a diet. Amen. <sighs> Forget exercise. <laughs> right? Look in the mirror. You say, oh, good. <laughs> yeah, I'm not 18, 21 no more. Amen. My chest done fell in my drawers. It's over. <laughs> Right? Listen, we got expectations, rightly, wrongly. But you know what? I, 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 I try to give up all that stuff. Maybe there's a measure of good and all that stuff, and I understand there's good intentions. But uh, right here, this, this provokes me. And uh, I want to try to help you. Uh, 
I'm persuaded of better things of you and of things that accompany salvation. Uh, turn to Luke. Luke chapter number 12. Luke chapter number 12. I am persuaded of better things of you. Verse 48. Now, some men will preach this and as applying to the church at the judgment seat, but I don't believe this. Verse 48. But he knew not, talking about the Lord's will. Verse 47, And that servant which knew not his Lord's will, prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, did not commit, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. People are teaching you, there's Baptist preachers who teach you, you're going to go to the judgment seat and you're going to get whipped. Well, ain't that the blessed hope? Huh? If you did good, <clears throat> you only get licked a few times. You get a few stripes. Boy, that makes me want to go see my Savior real bad, doesn't it? Huh? And then if you, you didn't live for God, man, you're getting a lot of stripes. That's not applying to the church. It's not church age doctrine. That's not the judgment seat of Christ. And if God does take you to the woodshed and you do get spanked, guess what? You deserved it then, don't you? But that ain't the blessed hope. And I see, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, that my works are going to be judged, right? And what's wood, hay, and stubble is going to be burned up. I don't see no fire there. It's on your rear end, dude. You're getting stripes. <laughs> right? But there's a message inside here for us. Look at what it says. For whomsoever... For, for unto whosoever, or whomsoever, much is given, of him shall be what? Much required. To whom men have committed much, of him they will what? Do you believe that? That's a good principle. Has a lot been committed to you? What, what have you been in charge of and enriched of? What's been given to you by God? What's God got an expectation for you? How much preaching have you heard? How much Bible reading have you got? How much grace has been stored? And how much blessing has been in your life? How much has you been forgiven? Were you a big sinner when you got forgiven? Shouldn't you be able to forgive little sinners a lot easier? How come we can get over the big things, we can't get over the little things? You know, churches are so full of people that want God's forgiveness, but they can't forgive one another over petty Selfish little thing. More churches are split over petty. You see the way she looked at me? I ain't ever going back. Oh, really? All it took is a little glance. I know what it was. She came in with a brand new dress, and your husband would give you a brand new dress, and so therefore you're mad because sister so-and-so is wearing a brand new dress. And you're mad at him, but you're mad at her because she come in and she flaunted it in front of you. Right? Hello? I mean, that kind of stuff happens in churches all the time. Luke 16. Luke chapter number 16. Listen, I'm talking about God. I'm persuaded of better things of you. I have a persuasion in my heart that I believe that because you're a professing Christian, you're a child of God, you've been born again, that there's a greater expectation upon your life. And when preachers tell me something, I expect more out of a preacher than I do a church member. If a preacher tells you something, his word ought to be his bond. And he ought to back it up. If he said he's going to be there, he ought to be there. He ought to be able to tell you and call you and text you in this day and time and say, guess what, I'm going to be late, I can't make it, instead of ignore you and never bring it up. Right? I know preachers that book, book meetings. And... Uh, they turn around and they don't show up. And the preacher calls and says, hey, man, where are you at? He says, well, uh, I, I'm down here preaching. He says, what do you mean? You was booked for me? Yeah, that was only one day. I got a week over here, so I, I, I didn't. Never called, never, never said nothing. And everybody had it all rolled out, motel reserved, everything planned. But the guy chose to go to a better meeting because he thought he was getting a better offering. But he's supposed to be an independent, Bible-believing, fundamental preacher, King James, never a bit of literature, tearing everybody's heads off and spitting all over the place. But yet, he ain't got the common courtesy to tell another preacher that I booked a meeting, but I'd rather go somewhere else because I think I'm getting a bigger paycheck. And we're supposed to have revival in America? When preachers ain't got enough decency to talk to other preachers 
and have kindness to them? Well, I'm walking with God. I don't have to give account to nobody. You set the appointment, didn't you? You're the one who made the appointment. You're looking like an idiot making decisions and planning meetings and people are trying to have you into their lives and invite you in because you supposedly are tapped into God. We're persuaded what? Better things. You understand? Look at Luke 16 says. You guys ready to hit the altar? This is a good one. Verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in can you take care of the little things? Let me ask you a question. Can you pick up the trash you drop on the floor? I mean, you guys get a candy wrapper out of the bowl. I mean, surely you can hit a trash can with it, right? It's not going to be all over the place. It's not going to be on the counter, on the chair, on the floor, right? A little thing. You get a piece of paper, a piece of candy, you got a wrapper, where does it go? It should. But how come I pick them up all the time? That's a little thing, right? You get something out, you what? Put it back. And that's all. Brother Doug was talking about a young man that got a tool set the other day. And uh, he got a tool set. Now he's real responsible for putting the tools back because they're his tools. <laughs> when they weren't his tools, he didn't put them back. But now they're his tools. They got a slot in that little box. You got to put them right back in there. He knows something's missing if he goes to close it. So he remembers to put it back in there. Why? Because you put it back where you got it from, it'll be there the next time you get it, right? Being faithful over little things. You know how many people can't put things back where they belong? Everything in its place and every a place for everything. Right? I'm getting under conviction, ain't I? <laughs> or am I putting you under conviction? But I'm just talking about being faithful in little things. If you, if you can't be faithful in a little thing, how can you be faithful in much? So what do you do? You trust people to do things. You know how many people cannot follow through with the little things? But they want to do the great thing, and the great thing I'm going to do is a success, and there's preachers, man. They want to do the great thing, but they can't do the little thing. Like send a thank you card. Boy, they like the offer, and they want to come preach. They want that offer, and they go out the door, but they can't send a thank you card and say, I appreciate being with you all. I love you. Now, there are preachers that do. I'm just telling you there's others. They don't thank you. You understand? Is that so hard? I'm just talking about being faithful in little things. Right? Should I miss you? No, just teach that. <laughs> Hello. He that's faithful in that which is least also is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in least is unjust also in much. You know what Danny Farley said? Danny Farley was a preacher in Houston, Texas, Shady Acres Baptist Church. And uh, he talked, he preaches on finances. He went to school and majored in finances and stuff like that. And he, he's taken things to the Bible and he's preached and he's helped preachers and people and churches all around the country to be able to help them. And he preached on river rat mentality. And the average person's got river rat mentality. And uh, they, they always got to go for the cheapest. They always got to have this thrift store mentality. They can't ever buy nothing new. And everything they buy never works. And and uh, it's, just, it's just a bad thing. You understand what I'm saying? But Danny Farley brought this out. He says, you'll never get a hold of your finances until you track every cent you spend. When you cash in the change in your pockets and you're always cashing in your dollar bills and you're putting them in pop machines and snack machines and money here and money there and money here, all of, a sudden you'll, you, all of a sudden, you got $20, $30, $50, $100 a week or a month that you don't even know where it's going. You can't track it. You can't see where the problem is to fix it. But all you know is every time the paycheck comes around, you're broke. But it's five here, it's 10 there, it's three here, it's 10 there, it's 20 cents here, it's 50 cents there, it's $1.79 there. And you do all that, well, you can't track it. You know what? When you start tracking it, you'd find out how much you spend in coffee every day if you tracked your coffee. And you'd find out how much you spend on pop. And if you track everything that you spend all month long, at the end of the month, you'd be surprised at what you spend on pop if you tracked it. You'd be surprised what you spend on coffee and hamburgers and cheeseburgers and pizza, right? And then Brother Eastep's got a message on bringing home the bread and how to give more to God. People said, I can't give to God. Well, he goes through a list, and he can show people how to save almost two to $300 a month just in doing simple little things. 
And then they say, well, I can't give to God. No, they don't want to give up the junk and they don't want to be accountable. They just think if I'm just throwing money everywhere and I cut a few holes in my pocket and money just leaks out, it's doing all the things that I'm pleased with. So they got an excuse not to be able to support missions. But you can quit things and give up things. She knows a lady that her mom died without life insurance and it caused hardship on the family and everything. And so she was talking to that lady and she said, you know what? You don't need to put your daughter in that same situation. And she goes, well, I can't afford it. She goes, well, let's go through your life and let's see what you spend money on. And she showed her what it'd take to afford to have life insurance on her now that if something happened to her, her little daughter wouldn't have to have the hardships that her, she's had. And through the process of time, she's saying that if she gave up Pepsi-Cola, she had enough money to turn around and pay for life insurance that her daughter, in case of hardship came up, would be able to be covered, that she could have some help. You understand what I'm saying? But who wants to hear that i got to give up Pepsi-Cola to make it? See, because we got all these things we like. We like going to the stores. We, we knew a couple that came to church for a while. They said on Friday night, we're hitting Walmart. We could care about less about our bills, and we're just going to go buy and spend. Both of them worked, and they're going to buy and spend, do whatever they want to do. They're going to fill up the shopping carts. They're going to take all that junk home. And then whoever cries the loudest gets paid. And they're facing foreclosures, and they're facing bankruptcy and all kinds of other things, but they did not want to sit down with somebody that knows how to help them snowball debt and how to be accountable. If you can't be faithful and least, you know what I did? I started receiving everything I did, and I bring her home a receipt every time. I mean, I stack them up. She's got to go through all this piece. I don't know if she throws them all away or what, but you know what? I, I receipt everything. You know how much money I put in a snack machine this last year? I got it down to the penny. Zero. You know how much I put in a pop machine? Zero. You know how much I've spent on coffee the last three months since I quit? Zero. Amen? When I don't have, if she don't pack me enough food, I just call her and bring me a sandwich. Amen? And then she pays for it. <laughs> right? We got that down pat, don't we? But I'm just talking about being faithful in little things. Right? Maintenance. Maintenance is a big thing. If we don't maintain, we're going to pay the big thing. Fram oil filter. Pay me now. Pay me later. Preacher, you ever going to get to the message? Okay, let's go. On. Verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have been faithful in unrighteous mammon, if ye have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust what? If you can't take care of your money, and you can't be faithful to go to work and get out of bed, who's going to give you a Sunday school class? Right? If you can't, you can't pay your bills, who's going to entrust you to be a manager? Right? you got to be able to handle the, unri the, 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 un the unrighteous mammon. Who's going to give you true riches? Who's going to put to your trust to lead and guide and direct men if you can't take care of the little things in your own life? Boy, you ought to hear him preach down at Missionary Candidate School, Jack Woods in Heaven and all that now, but they'd come in and they'd have missionaries come in and they're coming into Candidate School, so they, they're looking for this mission board to take them on so they could go out in deputation and try to go reach the mission field. And Jack Wood made fun of him. He said, yeah, you guys come in here, your, coat, your hair's uncombed, your shirt's untucked. He said, you turn around and the back seat of your car is full of coffee cups and hamburger wrappers and all this other kind of stuff. Then you come in here like, you know. He goes, man, if you can't even clean up your own back seat of your car, why should I support you? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, he, he, he was just trying to help missionaries. And then, and then uh, those guys would blast those missionaries and they'd call them moochinaries. And they'd give them a hard time because that's all they want. They just want money. They just want love offering. And so they're on perpetual deputation. They don't have their life in order. They don't have their act in order. Listen, Jack Wood said this. He said, if you're a missionary and you come knock on my door and said, I want you to support me. I'm God called me to Russia or whatever. He said, how long have you been sitting under your pastor? How long have you been a member of that church? He said, well, I've only been called to preach two years and I've only been under him two years. He said, he said go back, sit under your preacher and call me in 10. What? I can't believe the man of God said that. I mean, God called me to go to Russia. Yeah, well, he called an unequipped person. Military 
They're going to put you out in battle until they take you to your boot camp and they break you down. They strip you of everything you've got and retrain you to get you to think the way they want you to think. They don't just automatically stick you in unless it's wartime. Here's a gun. Go pull the trigger. Point it that direction. <laughs> right? Hopefully you'll hit something. I mean, listen, I, I'm just trying to tell you, uh, we, we expect somebody to go through college. We expect somebody to, to have their life together before we give them a good job out there and expect to know what they're doing. I mean, do you take a, a guy that wants to be a lawyer off the street and then have him sit there and try to represent you in the court of law? The funniest thing in the world is to see some guy want to represent himself as a lawyer in a root court, and he's got a professional prosecutor sitting on the opposite side of him, and you've got a jury over there and a judge, and everybody's laughing at the idiot in the courtroom because he thinks he's doing a good job representing himself. And that's what the average guy is. He don't want to go through the preparation to get there. Amen? Look at what it says. If you have not been faithful where? In that which is another man's. Who should give you that which is your own? You can't sit and be taught and go through disciple classes and be taught the word of God. Then how, why should you have a Sunday school class? Right? I mean, that's what I see out of that. Amen. But you know what? There's a bunch of jack legs out there that they got saved. They got called to preach, man. They got a verse, and they, got a, they know how to spit, and they know how to scream, and they know how to holler, and they know how to jump all over the auditorium. They don't know the lick of the Bible. And I know preachers that will tell you, they'll say, God didn't call me to Bible school. Yeah, I can tell. I can tell that. He didn't call you to Bible school. <laughs> Amen. And everywhere they go, it's a mess. You know what I found out being an evangelist? There's a whole lot of preachers out there that don't know a whole lot of Bible, and they don't want me to come in and preach it. Because they ain't studied like I've studied, and they're scared to be around me. You say, why? Because they're afraid that I'm going to correct them. They don't want to be corrected. They just want to go and eat hamburgers and jump to pews and scream and holler about how good God is. We're saved. We're going to heaven. Glory to God. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. We're not going to burn in hell. Amen. Glory to God. Woo! And just, we're just having a time, ain't we? Pass a hamburger. Let's get some tea. Let's have spaghetti. Let's go out and eat some pizza tonight. I shouted for Jesus. And they ain't going to teach you nothing that book says. And then they want to criticize the ones that spend time studying it. Right? I've seen so many preachers that can't even take care of their wife and their children at a meeting. Can't even make their kids mind. And this woman's taking diaper bags, carrying three kids out of the church service, and the guy's sitting there. You know, he, he's the man of his house. Oh, yeah, I can tell you the man. And then you show up over there. Woman, give me some coffee. It's cold. Okay, big bucks. Amen. Amen? Do I do that to you? I don't have to because she turns around. Honey, would you like anything? Would you like anything? Because well, she serves. She waits. She's willing to do it. I don't have to bark at nothing. Amen. I better get off all that. She'll get the big head in me. I mean. <laughs> hey, man, I'm just good to have fun preaching, ain't it? All right, you guys ready for a sermon? I said, preacher, you're just full of hot air. Hey, Amen, forgive me. Hey, Amen, I'm persuaded of better things of you. You know, if you're faithful in that which is much or little, you'll be faithful in much. And that's what I'm, I want. I want to see you... Uh, to be able to take what you're learning and where you're going to be able to do better things, number one. Amen? Because of your testimony. Amen? Because of your testimony. Let me ask you a question. Do you have a testimony? I'm persuaded better things than because of your testimony. So what's your testimony? Isn't that your profession of faith? Huh? You, you've come forward and said, I was a sinner. And I, I trusted Jesus Christ my Savior. I took him to be my Lord and my Savior. That makes you my brother. That makes you my sister. That makes you a child of God. Because of your testimony, I'm persuaded of better things. Listen, you might have been a sorry rascal. I was. I was sorry. I still am sorry. But I'm, a, I'm on the way up. I'm moving up. You understand? I'm gaining ground every day. There's things better today than they were last time, right? But now that I'm a, I got a testimony, I'm a child of God, people expect something out of me. The lost world says, oh, you're a Christian? 
uh, what do you got this and this and this and this and this going on in your life? Well, I'm a new convert. I just got saved. I, I'm still working on some things. Well, Christians shouldn't smoke. You're right. Christians shouldn't smoke. Pray for them. I'm not saying I do. I, had, I struggled with it for a little while. I've had victory over it now 33 years. Isn't that a great thing? Fixing to be 34. That's a good thing. And I'm not kicking you if you do smoke. I'm just saying, once you're saved, now you claim you're a child of God. They expect that stuff to leave your life. They don't expect Christians to drink. They don't expect Christians to smoke. They sure don't expect Christians to cuss. They expect your language to be changed now that you're Christian. And you know what? The world out there expects a Christian to be at church every time the doors are open. This is why I talk to my neighbor. He doesn't think I ought to go to church all the time. Okay, well then, believe what your neighbor believes instead of what you believe. You understand? What about the way you dress? They expect you to dress different, right? I don't expect Christians to go bikini hopping all over the place, you know? Hey, Amen. Hello. My preacher t said he went down to, this, down to Gatlinburg, and he said, up walks this evangelist, man. He's got these Bermudas on, a tank top on. He about had a fit. <laughs> Just people think, well, I'm out of town. I'm, I'm somewhere else. Nobody knows me. I can dress like the world. He said, what's wrong with Bermudas? We ain't got time to get in on it. You understand what I'm saying? There ought to be something expected different. Now, the Amish dress because that's a religion, the way they dress. But they let them slip away. They let them, when they're 16, go out and do whatever they want to do. And then they make a commitment. They don't, they don't, once they go back to the place, they get water baptized into that colony. They get baptized into what they profess to be a church. And then they accept all the rules and regulations. And then you don't see them wander away from that. You profess you're an Amish, you better, you better stick straight. You better not have an electric cord running across your backyard, across the fence to your heathen, worldly neighbor and borrow his electricity so you can run your power saws over there because you don't have a power line coming into your property. That's hypocrisy, right? Listen, the world, we're persuaded of better things, of you. Listen, I know you're not perfect. I know you're not sinless. I know you have flaws. I know you got a lot to work on. So do I. That's where forgiveness and grace comes in. But if you're a professing Christian and you're growing, I expect more. Listen, I'm not saying, listen, I could go play golf with Brother Rob, and Brother Rob could hit a shot, you know, and a seasoned four-letter word just might come out of his mouth. And he might go, ooh, I'm sorry. And I'd say, hey, man, I can forgive you. But not every shot. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, I can have grace, but not, <laughs> right? But I'm persuaded of your testimony. Amen. Uh, I'm, I'm persuaded about the text you received. The text you received. You ever, do you have the received text? Huh? I believe I got the, the Word of God. I got a King James Bible. You got a testimony. You're a Bible believer. We, we need to have our lives lined up according to Pauline epistles, then, don't we? I got grace. Amen. You might think I'm worldly. Amen. I mean, yesterday, uh, I watched the Buckeye game. Somebody said, well, you're worldly. Well, we fast-forwarded through all the commercials. We played a couple games, had good fellowship, had some snacks with my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, and then we got on, and when the game came on, just went right through and watched the plays. You understand what I'm saying? So we've seen some plays and all that. But we're a bunch of Christians trying to avoid all the worldly junk and enjoy the ball game in the process. Of it. You understand what I'm saying? But the text I receive, I'm a Bible believer. And because of that, the world expects me to live according to the Bible. And the world thinks out there that the Sabbath is Sunday. The Sabbath is not Sunday, it's a Saturday. And then you've got a group of people out there, the seven-day disadvantaged, think they've got to live it. And they think they got to do that on Saturday. So if I go home, or I miss church today, and I go home and mow the grass, the world goes, I thought he was a Christian. What's he doing mowing the grass on Sunday? So therefore, I don't mow the grass on Sunday. Why? Because the world thinks that it's the Sabbath. They've been misled. Listen, you may have to do some things on Sunday, but I don't miss church to do that. I'll take care of it between church, before church, after church, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, but I'm not going to miss church for my water heater. We'll just have to do without water for the next couple of days and get it fixed. You understand? But I know a bunch of people, well, church is gone. I'm just going to miss the preacher today. I've got to take care of the water heater because I'm not going to infringe on my time. 
I don't take it away from God. I'll take it away from church. You understand what I'm saying? You can do whatever you want to do. You can do it however you want to do it, but I'm, I'm persuaded of better things. Though. Right? People do miss. I mean, they do miss church. So anyway, but because of your text you received, because of your translation, Colossians chapter number 1, You said, what are you talking about? I was translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. I'm talking about when you got born again. I'm not talking about which version of the Bible you have. I'm talking I was taken out of the devil's family and I was placed into Christ's family. I'm persuaded better things of you if you've been delivered from the power of darkness. So therefore, I think darkness ought to be leaving your life instead of people walking in darkness and fellowshipping with darkness and enjoying darkness and enjoying all that dark dead stuff out there and dark music and dark videos and watching wicked things. You understand what I'm saying? I've been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. There's a trans translation uh, that took place there. Now I'm God's Son, so you know what? I ought to live like it. I ought to talk like it. I ought to live like I'm going to heaven instead of living like I'm going to hell. I ought to live in such a way that as though somebody knows my life's changed. There's a bunch of churches out there that says you can come as you are, do whatever you want to do. You can look like the devil's children and have fun and we'll bring in the devil's music and we'll just celebrate and we'll spike our hair like they spike it and we'll do all the junk that they do and we'll just call it all going to heaven. Because God is just one big, giant, juicy, wet kiss. Right? I don't want to go with the hogs and the dogs when I'm a sheep. What fellowship does a sheep have with a hog and a dog? Right? But the, the world out there, man, I mean, God's got enough sense to separate the cows and the horses and the dogs and the chickens. and You understand? But the world, they just think you got to bring it all in. You know what they got? They got a zoo. Welcome to Zoo Baptist Church. Amen. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. Amen. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? You know what he wants you to do? He wants you to, he wants you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know what? I'm, I'm persuaded better things of you that I believe if you really got saved, I believe you want to please God. And if you really want to please God, you know what I do? I believe you're going to dedicate your body to God. And if I believe you're really saved and you really want to live for God, you know what I'm persuaded? That over there, when you read in Romans chapter number 6, you're going to yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, your body. I don't believe you're going to yield yourself to the wrong things. I'm persuaded of better things. Though. I don't believe you're going to want to take in liquor. I don't believe you're going to want to smoke. I don't believe you're going to yield your ears to gossip. I don't believe you want to use your tongue to gossip and cuss and swear and tell dirty jokes. I believe you're going to want to take your, your feet to the right places. Right? Why? Because you dedicated your body. You trans right? transform. I believe you're going to think different. Right? Be transformed what? By the renewing of your mind. I'm persuaded that if you get in that book and you sit under preaching, you're going to quit CNN and you're going to quit Fox News and you're going to quit all that junk and you're going to start beginning to think like a Christian instead of like a, a worldly scholar and philosophy and all that other junk. You understand? The hardest part is to get Christians to get their ears in the right place to listen to the right things that it might change their thinking. The reason why people are in so much trouble and they're in so much sin, it's what they're thinking. It's who they run with, right? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sinneth in the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he doth meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water, bringing forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Listen, you listen to the wrong people, you sit with the wrong people, you run with the wrong people, you're going to be like the wrong people, Right? Amen. By your transformation. You need to have your minds. Listen, I'm persuaded by your testimony. Number two. Amen. I, I'm, I'm persuaded better things of you because of the time you put in. The 
time you put in. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? Do you put any time in serving God? How much time do you put in your Bible reading? I, I'm expecting something to happen in your life. You're reading that book. That book's alive. You spend time in that book. I'm expecting that book to do something to you because that book's got a testimony that it'll do something to you. Sin will keep you from that book. That book keep you from sin. Thy word have I hid in my heart. That I might not sin against thee, right? Psalm 119, verse 9. He said, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Right? There's a bunch of people out there. I, oh, no way. I ain't even started. Erase that in the first 20 minutes. Amen? We'll add 20 to it. Amen? Right? John 8, 47 says, He that's of God heareth God's words. You hear them not, therefore you're not of God. Listen, over there in James, or John, 1 John 4, he says, By this you'll know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He said, Try the spirits. See whether they be of God or not. He said, He that's of the world heareth not us. He that's of God heareth us. Pretty simple. Well, listen, you spend time in the book. You're going to want to hear God's people speak. You don't want to be around the world. If you want to hear the world, and you don't want to hear God, that's telling me a lot about you. You might not have one of them. Right? Amen? That's pretty simple, ain't it? Amen? By the time they put in. Amen? You know what that means? I got a, I got a cuss word coming at you. Discipline. That's what a disciple is, isn't he? How many Christians are disciplined in the things of God? Praying, reading, witnessing, giving, going, doing. Right? You have a di the Bible talks about diligence. We can all pray now. Father, help us, Lord, diligent. Oh, my God. Right? Discipline. Amen? How's your discipline? That stinking screw came out again. Discipline. Amen. <laughs> she like that, huh? Amen. Your devotions. You know what he said in Acts 17? He said, I passed by and beheld your devotions. Paul said that to men at Mars Hill, them philosophers. He said, I beheld your devotion to an unknown God. He said, him, I declare unto you. You know, I looked up in the 1828 dictionary. You know what a devotion is? It has to do with addiction. You know what that heroin addict is devoted to heroin. He gives all his love and attention, focus, his money, his time and energy to, to heroin. He said, well, he's addicted. You're right. That's what you should be. You should be addicted to your Bible. You should be addicted to prayer. You should be addicted to the things of God. You ought to have a devotion to God. Now, a Catholic priest wants to wear funny garments and have a big old rosary hanging around his neck, you know, and he wants, he wants you to know he's devoted. Well, Matthew 23 talks about all that, right? He said, when you pray, go in your secret place. Your Father reward you openly. He said, when you fast, wash your face. Because all they do it is to be seen of men. God don't want you to be seen of men, but when men see you, they want to see the glory of God on you. They want to behold your good works. God wants you to shine for Him, and it don't happen. If you ain't putting it on the inside, it ain't ever going to show up on the outside. Right? I'm persuaded of better things, though. You profess to be saved. I, I, I believe that you, you're going to see the changes start taking place in your life. Right? Those devotions. Amen? The time you put in. Amen? I'll give you this last one. I, I got a bunch more coming. Amen? Because of the treasure you give. You know what I believe? I believe if you believe in it, you'll support it. Right? You know where you know where men give their bodies? Sports. They're not going to give it to preaching and teaching and witnessing. They're, they're going to give it to sports. They abuse their body. 
They give their all, and then they're too frail and too fragile to be able to serve God. Boy, if we gave a commitment to soul winning like we do to sports, we'd win this world, wouldn't we? The time we spend just enjoying the flesh. Right? The treasures you give. The Bible says lay up your treasure in heaven. So let me ask you a question. How do you do that? He says for where your treasure is, your, there your heart is also. So where's your treasure at tonight? IRA, 401k, stocks and bonds. Huh? Retirement place down in Florida on a golf course with a yacht. I mean, where? where? <laughs> you understand? Where's your treasure at? Let me let me say this. Let me throw this out. You might you might not ever think about this. You ever think about a spiritual four hundred one k? Did you ever think about setting money aside monthly? Amen. To invest. In your millennial 401k, what you're going to spend in the millennium, that it might draw interest. You know, as I support missionaries and I give to the works of God, that's besides tithe. I'm talking above and beyond tithe. As I give those things and support those missionaries to help further the gospel and do all that stuff, every bit of that's going into my treasure chest. That's where treasure, you put treasure, you put it in a treasure chest. And when I get up there, God's going to open up that treasure chest. And I believe that's going to be my millennial spending account. I believe that as, as it's drawn interest in the things that I do to build uh, 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 work for God and do things for God, I believe there's going to be gold and silver and precious stones. And, and then the gifts that I give and, and the things that I do, then I get to open it up and spend it with her. The Bible says she that tarried at home, amen, divided the spoil. We divide the spoil. I'll sit there and I'll divide it. I believe churches are going to divide the spoil. The works that we do in the neighborhoods and the community as a church, as a whole, the people we support, the people we help, I believe we're building up treasure. When we give gifts to help men and help them, further them, we get some treasure from them. We invest in Brother Doug. We invest in Brother Woodby. We invest in Brother McFadden. We invest in those guys. And as we help them and we help Brother Gabbard and we help those guys and we invest in their lives and help them in their ministries, then God says, I'm going to have them reach into the treasure chest and throw a handful into your pot. I believe there's going to be a lot of wealth trading at the judgment seat. Take for him that has the talent buried and give to him that hath ten, right? They were trading up there, right? Taking from one guy and giving it to another guy. You know what I believe? I believe churches as a whole, they're, they're trying to support the work of God and do things. God's got it all sorted out. God's got it all balanced out. And each Christian's got his own little treasure chest, and the church has got a treasure chest as a whole. And then I believe there's going to be swapping and trading. Some guy's going to come in and say, man I, man, I can't believe you got all that treasure for me. He said, God said, you only put $32.59 in the church in the last 30 years. What makes you think you're going to get something? Well, that widow over there, yeah, that widow put in 152 bucks in 30 years, but that's all she had. She gave her mites. You understand? So take you 33 bucks and give it to her. Whoa, boy, that's, you talk about, man, you're changing the judge. You're adding to the Bible. I'm just trying to tell you that there's treasure in heaven, and there's, there's an exchanging going on up there. You know what? I, I want to lay up as much as I can in heaven. Yeah, there's time to use money down here, and there's things down here. But I'm telling you, there's so many people got so much stuff in their garages and their properties and store locks. You know how many store locks are filled with junk people can't even put in their garages, and they can't even get in their basement. They can't even get in their attics, and their closets are vomiting out, and they're anxiously getting ready to go buy more at the stores at Christmas time. And the work of God is neglected, and the people of God are neglected. I'm persuaded of better things by the treasures you give. Listen, you give all that God wants you to give, I am happy. <laughs> if God tells, listen, the Bible says, as man purposes in heart, so let him give. If you purpose not to give, that's between you and God. But I like to try to provide opportunities. Say, hey, you want to get in on the work? You want to help support the work? I believe giving my tithe to God, I start off with 10%, automatically go to God. And plus, I've been doing that for a long time, above and beyond that. Why? Just to make sure the work's going, to provide people an opportunity to be able to come and, and be able to give. You know what? That's part of it. And then on top of it, I try to get the missionaries, and I try to do things. People say, well, why don't you have this? Why don't you own this? 
Well, I haven't gone and bought a brand new speaker set, microphones and everything because we're doing things to try to keep the gospel going and trying to reach people and help preachers and help things like that. We really don't need a microphone, do you? You have a problem hearing the kids sing? I'd like to have a microphone. I'd like to have all this stuff. People say, oh, you ought to have a CD. Well, they're so used to just putting everything on Visa and MasterCard. I don't want, I don't want to do all that. But I want to give what I do have. And when it comes in, I want to be able to support things and do things for God to get the gospel out there and help God's men and help keep people going. There's things I want to do. I mean, I told Brother Yoakum, he wrote a book. I got him a meeting. He, we're, me and him are going to talk next week. I said, I said, Brother, I said, I'm going to give you 100 bucks towards them books. I want, I want $100 worth of your books. He's selling them for 12 bucks a piece. And then, what? He's got wrote a book about trying to encourage people to go to nursing homes and to be able to have a nursing home ministry and reach people. And so I'm going to get some of the books, and hopefully you guys will read them. And it, it just talks about trying to reach people, being concerned about reaching people. And he's got a burden about trying to reach people. So I'm investing in David Yoakum. You understand what I'm saying? Trying to get some treasure, trying to get some things going there. Yeah, I could probably sell everything I got and invest in one thing, but you think God wants me to sell my truck that I get to work in to, to sell it so I have to walk to work? He ain't asking me to do something that crazy. You understand what I'm saying? But if he did, I'd do it. If he said to give that truck to Brother Yoakum, I'd do it. Why? It's for Christ's purpose. It's for his. Why? That I might have some treasure in heaven. Because of the treasures you give. That's what I'm excited about. Listen, I'll finish this thing tonight. I was wondering what I was going to preach tonight, but I guess I know what it is. I'll finish this sermon up. But listen. I'm persuaded of better things of you. I'm not saying this just so I can get money in the offering plate. Just so I can go full time and sit around and drink coffee and eat donuts. Amen. And, and just be free and not have to work a job while all the other men are working jobs. That ain't what I'm saying. I don't want to do all that stuff. If the church ever could afford to have me, amen, and pay my bills, that would be a nice thing. But I'm afraid that I don't know what I'd do with that time. So well, there's plenty of books. You know, yeah, there's a lot of books to read. I'm stocking up on books to read if I ever go full time. Amen? I probably won't ever get to read them. But I got one book. I get to spend a lot of time in. And I'd love to organize my sermons and do all that kind of stuff. But I don't even know how to do that right now. Yeah, I work a lot. I work, I've worked, uh, I can't tell you how many hours I've worked lately. It was 61.2 this last week. And, and so I'm doing all that. So my meal here is probably not as good. So, you know, you guys enjoying your baloney. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is I'll probably never get to that place. And I'm, I'm fine with that. But I want to do something. I want to be able to give. I want to support the things of God. I want to be able to help preachers come through here. I'm trying to dream about God. Who do you want me to have in for revival? I'd like to have a revival. And there's so many preachers I'd like to have but I want to make sure I got the right one. But you know what I want to do? I want to take care of them. But I don't want to put a burden on you, but I want you to be able to participate, to give you opportunities to have treasure. But you don't need what I'm doing to provide treasure. You can give treasure. You can find people that need some. You can help somebody, can't you? Right? But I just like to provide opportunities for those who's dedicated their life to Jesus Christ to go and reach people. Amen? I mean, we could probably gather a gift together. And, and help Brother Gabbard's daughter out there reaching Mexicans and in Arizona, you know, feisty. I mean, we could give to that. Amen. Uh, I'd love to have a mission, missionary movement and, and a mission conference and things like that. Well, try to raise awareness to help people, to provide you opportunities to say, hey, what can I do with this? Can I help somebody here? Yeah, you, this guy's good. This guy's good. That guy's good. There's a bunch of them out there that's good. You understand? I might not choose some of the places you choose. And maybe you might have to grow up. There might be somebody that I wouldn't trust, I mean, that you might, but help them. I mean, there might be a little orphan kid in your neighborhood who needs a bicycle, and you buy him a new bicycle. That's a blessing. God's not against that. You understand? You may not be a missionary, but it might be a door open to witness to somebody and reach them. You understand? I mean, God wants us to take time for others and to reach them. And somehow we get treasure. And so that's why I try to give all that I can give and do what I can do to what? You said, well, it's all selfish motive. It's all for Christ. And I want to live well in the millennium. Amen? I said there's a bunch of people that are going to be paupers in the millennium, and they're going to be mad at these preachers 
because they had no idea. They thought heaven was it. They had no idea what they're going to do in the millennium. Right? And when they get up there and they're broke and they don't have a spiritual 401k and they don't have no interest on anything that they did for God and they go up there and they ain't got nothing, I told them, I said, don't come to me and ask me for a handout. Amen. If they want to live for it all down here and party all down here, and when I get up there, they don't want to give here and then they expect what I gave here to spend over there for them. Uh uh. You blew yours here, you blew it over there. Right? <laughs> if I'm sacrificing for my children and my wife and everything and putting it in the work of God and the things of God so I can have a better future over there instead of a better future down here, and they put it all down here so they thinking nothing about the millennium. And all they thought about it was living for now. They, they, can, they can take that one up with the Lord. I say, see this little piece of cardboard? You write on it, will work for food. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Rob, would you pray for us? Suppose at night when you close your eyes You take your final breath All the years you spent here on earth Not a minute would you have left Did you ever ask the Lord to save you Ever get down on your knees and pray Do you know what you're gonna hear when you face him on judgment day Will he say in her in my good and faithful one Or will he say depart from me I never knew you and the wicked things you've done Will you 